Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, could I please kindly ask you to take your seats? We are ready for the next session. Supporting economic continuity, investment, export, globalization, and opportunities will be our subject in the next session. Our moderator will be Honorable Dimitri Nataluka, Chairman of the Economic Affairs Parliamentary Committee and Member of Parliament of Ukraine. Just if you could kindly please take your seats. I want to also start by calling our speakers that are coming up next. President of Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce and Industry Ukraine, Mr. Gennady Chizikko, again on stage, if we could kindly call him. And Honorable Member of Parliament of Estonia, former Minister of Entrepreneurship, Andres Sut, please. Member of Parliament of Estonia, former of Minister of Entrepreneurship and Information Technology, Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications from Estonia. Mr. Zaiga Leipina, Deputy Sec State Secretary of the Ministry of Economics of the Republic of Latvia, please. And from Bosnia, Herzegovina, Head of Economic Affairs Committee, Member of Parliament, Maria Pendes. We are about to start, so can I kindly ask, please, to take your seats? In our next panel, we will be trying to go over the subjects, understanding the need for coordinated regional and international reorganization of supply chains and investment priorities as a result of the war in Ukraine. This special panel session will provide the audience with deep insights into complex issues from the perspective of governmental and industry leaders the need for economic continuity in Ukraine and neighboring countries, how they are working with their local constituents to sell their goods on the international mar market, all the while navigating complex compliance, logistics challenges, and other pandemic-related constraints, and how they're dealing with overcoming local economic infrastructure and related issues and constraints. So I want to slowly hand over the microphone to Honorable Dimitru Nataluka, Chairman of the Economic Affairs Parliamentary Committee, Member of Parliament of Ukraine. Hello. Hello Welcome. You. And this is the next microphone for our speakers. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, esteemed members of the panel, Thank you very much, and uh, say thank you for, for being here. My name is Dimitri Nataluk. I'm the chairman of the Economic Committee uh, of the Parliament of Ukraine. I'm the guy who is unlucky to be in charge of the economy uh, of Ukraine in the Parliament during the war. So uh, I'm here to try to make it a bit better uh, for, for my country, for my people, for my nation, and I hope that uh, we can join our forces in doing so. So before the war started, Ukraine had at least 16 seaports, uh, 16 seaports, 13 airports, 20, uh, 20 airports, I beg your pardon, and 19,700 kilometers of railways. Now, today, as you might know, all the seaports are blocked and the airports don't work. Nothing flies there, unfortunately, and the railroad infrastructure has, come, has become a covid -ed target for Russians, and uh, the river transportation simply cannot cope with the amount of um, the, the goods that are flowing and trying to leave the country um, to the other jurisdictions. So we see that the supply chains are collapsing once a bit, once again, and um, this time not because of the COVID or for some objective reasons, but as you might well know, because of the war. And um, the idea is to um, unlock, right, unchain the supply chains in Ukraine because, as we have seen, this has um, a straight effect 
um, on, on, on the rest of the world. Now, we have, we have heard that there have been some discussions regarding the developing countries, but let me get this right. It's not only about the developing countries that we're talking about. And if you are a guy from Germany who loves beer, uh, you might find out that your beer has increased in its price because the beer, the German beer, has been malted also, uh, brewed from Ukrainian malt. If, if you're a UK citizen and you love your fish and chips, you might have noticed that your fish and chips got more expensive because the fish and chips have been fried in Ukrainian sunflower oil. If you're a guy from Italy and uh, you loved your Parma ham or the, the Italian Parmalat milk, you might have also noticed that the, the price has increased because Italian cows have been fed Ukrainian corn. And for that reason, the price for both the ham and the milk went up, and I'm not talking about the Salvatore Ferragano, cosmetics, and other uh, European luxury brands that have been using Ukrainian spirit that is also stuck in Ukraine. And for that reason, the price has gone up. So as we see today, the crisis that we are facing, the war that Russia has unleashed on the territory of Ukraine, um, is hurting not just the developing world, but the very well-developed world. And um, my objective here today is to try to discuss with our honorable panelists uh, an opportunity and a possibility of how to um, make that disappear and go away. And the first speaker I would like to introduce and to um, ask his opinion is Mr. Gennady Chizhikov. He's the president of the Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce and Industry which brings more than 8,000 businesses in Ukraine, a brilliant uh, leader, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, and a very intelligent person um, who has his, his very powerful views on, on the current situation. So, Mr. Chichikov, I know that only one out of the five businesses uh, were able to maintain the pre-war performance in Ukraine. The situation with wages and hiring is similar, so maybe you could give us an outlook. I think everybody might be interested to hear your personal assessment of business activity in Ukraine at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dmitro, for such a presentation. After these words, uh, I'd like to say thank you very much. I go out. That's all. <laughs> thank you. Uh, dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, I like it what to be sitting in this hall in uh, uh, very uh, hospitable, uh, hospitable, uh, hospitable country like uh, Turkey, where we can speak very slowly, very uh, in peaceful manner about the business, about the money, about the future. And uh, I would like to share with you some of my personal idea, my personal feelings, because war is emotion. First of all, after there's a logic. Some people don't have the logic, but we know who is. But uh, okay, but what about the em emotion? For us, it's a little bit more than four months, less than five, five months of war. But if somebody asks me how many years your war in your mind, these four months or the five months, this is remind me 12 minimum 12 li uh, years of my life. So many changes happened during this period of time. For example, uh, European Union. What means European Union for us? If to see the map of Ukraine, you understand. Ukraine is a big country, a little bit bigger than France. Uh, more than 40 million people it was. It will be. Okay, and uh, if you see the, our uh, strategy, strategy last 100 years after 1917, when U Ukraine was a part of the European Union, or Europe, sorry, it was Europe. And I still remember my grandmother uh, said about my country, uh, everybody knows in Ukraine, what Ukraine is the breadbasket of the Europe. Ukraine was oriented absolutely. And after 1917, yes, we uh, relocate our business to the interest of the Soviet Union from the west to the east. And what's now? We, uh, it's, uh, what is this war demonstrated? We come back to the, our roots. We come back to the, our real, um, uh, uh, how to say, nature. We would like to continue to be in the part of the normal civilization when the truth is a law. 
no lie is alone. He says, you understand what it means. Because if, uh, somebody asked me, what is it, uh, Ukraine, uh, sorry, uh, Soviet Union, what is Russia? It's always lies. This is, for me, I don't like to live in such a situation, etc. But, shortly, during these four months, we, Europe, we uh, demonstrated how it's possible to, to change their life from one situation to another. Uh, we go from the peaceful country to go to the uh, understand that what's war can, uh, can continue, nobody knows. One month, three months, three years, two years, nobody knows. This is a very complicated question. But we understand in Ukraine what's our future, it's economy. Because if you, uh, despite the situation we war, we needed to supply, uh, support Ukrainian uh, economy, etc. And where our future? The three, uh, as I mentioned, two sort of our border now is closed. Belarusia, Russia, Black Sea, Azov Sea. Absolutely blocked. We have only one window of the freedom for trade, for investment, for everything. Only the West vote. What means? Okay, tomorrow uh, everything will be okay. They blockade. Do you understand what's uh, here is a business? Business never forget. Trust is very important. If one time happened, or he will continue to think what it happened again, maybe again and again. That's why our strategy, West. We, because for us, it associated with normal rules, normal economical uh, uh, possibilities, etc. That's why I would like to attention, your attention, Ukrainian business understood. Our direction to the West is our the future. That's why I in, in, uh, attracted attention of the businesses who are sitting here. This is for a long period of time, for, for many years. That's why we need to pay attention how to support, how to find the possibility to win-win. I like a president of Chamber of Commerce, I contacted with all of the Europe countries. And despite this, we always uh, had a very good relations with all countries, but uh, most uh, in the volume, first of all, time, Germany, Italy, etc. But now the situation is also changed. For us, it became a more, more attractive country for the win-win uh, working. Our neighbors, starting from Bulgaria, Romania, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Poland, uh, Hungary, in, uh, Baltic countries. This, why? Because we can, uh, Ukraine is very much export-oriented country. We, ha we, have, uh, we produce too much for one country. We, just one example, this is also emotion. In our stocks, more than 2.5 million uh, tons of the sunflower oil. For Ukraine, we need it for ourselves, maximum 6,000, 600,000, 800,000. We have three, four times more than enough for, needed for us. Every second, like Dmitry said, every second battle in the world of sunflower oil, Ukrainian. Second. And what to do? How to do this? We, you, and now our Ukrainian business looking for opportunity how to adopt this Western border to the new supplies. I was very surprised what many big companies who now uh, before invested, Ukrainian international company in the ports, now started to organize the uh, rail, uh, rails, how to say, hubs on the, our border. We understood what. Uh, needed to find some new possibilities, to find some sub possible supply by car, by train, by any any possibilities. This is a new, uh, as I can say, new perspective for me, uh, for next 10, uh, 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years, and maybe for more. This is not just one day, and tomorrow will be everything different. One, if, uh, because situation with our neighbor is not possible to change one day, you understand. Uh, okay, this is very important. Come back to the uh, business. War is stress, of course, no. uh, and business uh, in the first uh, weeks stopped, and the many uh, businesses uh, can't work in the still now. According to different different statistics, nearby 30 percent, 30 percent of Ukrainian business stopped. You can imagine. If you're in your country, 3-0%, 30% stopped one day. What is it? But slowly, we see this percentage became less, 25, according to the information of National Bank. 
and more Ukrainian business come back to the, first of all, small and business, medium sized business come back to the normal life. We would like to produce something, we are looking for some possibilities, and what? Again, we are looking partners. We are looking some possibilities in our neighbors' country, in Europe, in Turkey, everywhere. We see huge opportunities for uh, not only for Ukraine, but for our partners. Please think about this we, and uh, don't uh, make a decision after uh, when the war finish. Everybody would like to do like this. When you, uh, but, but now it's a very good opportunity. And I very much appreciate it. What during a uh, uh, couple last months, we visit uh, our uh, country, visited not only uh, honorable presidents, prime ministers, ministers, but more interesting for us, for business, started to big business coming. And for me, was, for example, important was uh, John Denton, the General Secretary of ICC, International Chamber of Commerce, visited, and some another business association visit. It's demonstrated. Now it's time to think about the reconstruction now, the, the support Ukraine now, and to find your possibilities in the future. Needed, as if somebody asked me what's needed to do, contact with regions. Region 25 regions, it's different. Of course, in some regions, real war but in uh, many regions are very attractive for investment, etc. Uh, uh, finalizing, I would like to say the, uh, to the RX, Ukrainian business after the stress now started to adopt, we understand the economical front, front became very important for Ukraine, for Ukrainian business, but we can be winner, of course, in this war, but together with you, it will be more easy. And for us, very important, to share our uh, feeling of positive emotion with you. You can say, me or our company take, uh, pay a, 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 some attention, pay some tribute to the future of victory of Ukraine. Now, not after. After it will be not interesting. Of course, interesting, but not so like before. You understand, always more important, first love. Second love, of course, important. First love is always better. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, sorry, this is a little bit uh, uh, out of the business, but who knows? Who knows? That's why I, like the President of the Chamber of Commerce uh, and uh, President of Ukraine Business, I would like to say in Ukraine we have very strong system of uh, business associations. We create a coalition of business associations in Ukraine. We have very important, there are a lot of businesses here. Don't uh, lose the time uh, during the coffee break. Contact and contact, contact, uh, asking how it's uh, everything. Before uh, we, uh, I would like to say uh, one more. Today, in, uh, event for me is very important because I see in this uh, hall practically ninety percent of the business. For me, to speak with business always easy. I can say something, but he understand me better when I need it, like uh, politicians say, too much, and nobody understand you. <laughs> so, sorry, I'm <laughs> very, today is maybe the day of my jokes. Sorry, thank you very much, Dimitri. Go, let's go forward. Thank you, Gennady. <laughs> thank you, it was very insightful, I must say. 30% um, of the businesses you mentioned um, are out of market in Ukraine. Uh, we have another estimate at least 50% of the GDP uh, might be lost by the end of the year. But I agree totally with my colleague, uh, Hinadi Chizhikov, that when, where somebody sees a tragedy, and it is a tragedy in terms of the human lives, of course, there is also an opportunity. Because imagine that there is a country of 40 million people with 50% of the market that is ready to be started from scratch, literally. Uh, for instance, we had a delegation from one of the partner countries recently in Ukraine to the city of Bucha. You might have heard about it. And uh, we have organized a meeting with the mayor of Bucha. And um, it was a delegation with a lot of businessmen inside. And the question was, how can we help you today? And the answer was very simple. We need glass. Because as it turned out, before the active phase of war started uh, in February uh, 24th, Ukraine has been importing the major part of its glass from Russia. Now, do you imagine 
what amounts of glass are we talking about? Because every time a missile hits a place in Ukraine, the windows are blowing off, and that means glass is being destroyed. So as of today, the Ukrainian glass producers cannot cope with even 15% of the demand of glass that is required in the country. And that is simply one example of the business opportunities that are in Ukraine even today, and they are there. Um, and if you think that nobody dares to start business even uh, these days when the war is not over, you might be mistaken. An, an Irish company, uh, which is called the Kingspan, has announced that it will be investing 20 hundred millions of euro by the end of August to establish a construction hub in the west of Ukraine. Confirmation. Yeah. <laughs> um, an Italian company is considering uh, investing in the Ujgorod region, which is also in the west of Ukraine, in building housing for internally displaced people and for people from academia, for university professors and students uh, on a territory that is at least two hectares large. So these companies understand this momentum that has to be filled and they are actively entering uh, the Ukrainian market even giving the risk that is there, but they outweigh um, the, uh, the, the profit opportunities with the risk that is present. Now, um, as we have heard today also from Mr. Chizhikov, there is this, um, in a way, dependency which nobody realized uh, on, on the agro sector. And um, if I might say, there are two types of dependencies. Uh, a peaceful one, like the one that we have been talking today, the food security, we didn't call for that. I mean, we were just trading and trading, trying to establish as much uh, good partnerships as possible. And there is this hostile dependency, which has been uh, installed in a way to then manipulate this kind of dependency um, uh, in, in the foreign policy. And this is what Russia does. It, it weaponizes everything it can, starting from trade, ending with diplomats, uh, mass media, and so on and so forth. And um, we already see the outcome and the aftermath of uh, this manipulations and this blackmail. I'm talking about the natural gas blackmail, for instance. And there are countries in Europe that are already paying a very high price for that, for the firm and steady position, uh, the position of the true uh, values for freedom, for, for, for independence, and for defending what is right. And um, Estonia is one of those countries. Um, if my cal calculations are correct, the inflation today is at least 22%. Um, and first of all, because of the Russia's energy blackmail. And uh, to be honest, you are coping with that very decently. Um, nevertheless, Ukraine also uh, supplied the Estonian market with uh, metal furniture much more. And um, if we need to diversify our delivery routes, then you, on the contrary, uh, you need a counter cover, a temporary shortage uh, in the market to look for a, pr a, re um, a replacement from the Russian goods. So can you tell us more about how Estonia copes with the shocks and uh, what can we learn from you? Because obviously there is a lot. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please, Mr. Andres Sut, uh, my colleague from the Estonian parliament and a brilliant leader. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dmitry, and uh, very happy to be here in, in the conference. I think it is an opportune moment. It's a very central topic for the entire democratic world. And for me, there is one simple message for everybody here. Ukraine belongs to Europe. We will stand by Ukraine. We support you until you win the war, period. Now, uh, I think it was very right what you said about uh, Russia weaponizing everything. I think we need to be also crystal clear about the causes of inflation. It's not really that there is a lack of uh, grain or there is a lack of gas or there is a lack of uh, any, uh, any other. Uh, energy carrier, it is just an uh, insane, inhumane war what Russia is waging uh, in Ukraine and the suffering is spread across the world. So that I think is the reality we are facing. I pay a tribute to the Ukrainian people who are really brave, courageous and uh, also my colleagues from, from a parliament, uh, Verhovny Rada here in, 
in this room, really, really big applause because you are the best ambassadors of, of your country. You do a lot. Um, now you asked uh, how we cope. Uh, yes, inflation is a number one concern uh, in Estonia. Uh, it is primarily driven indeed by the energy prices. There are some other elements as well. Uh, and I very much agree with what uh, I think Alina said, citing to Winston Churchill, that with all difficulty, there is always a major opportunity. And if I look back on our journey in Estonia from early 90s to the present day, so that hasn't never been a smooth road. It has been, I can't compare it to the war, so that's, uh, it's a different uh, situation. But it has been uh, full of challenges. So what helped us a lot was real determination to turn to the West to, or to regain our position back in the West. And that uh, helped to create a business climate, which is very conducive for investment, precisely what you need in Ukraine now. And uh, we have had uh, a number of meetings uh, with our business community in Estonia. There have been a number of delegations also to Ukraine, and there will be more. I will also come myself uh, as, as soon as we, we can get the date, uh, date fixed. Confirmation. Uh, so, um, uh, and it is indeed opportunity for, uh, for both sides because you will have a massive need for investment. And I think you will enormously benefit from the fact that you can use the most advanced technologies uh, in, in every field. Uh, I think you will also fast forward to the renewable uh, energy because uh, this is sort of where the future is. Uh, again, the roads, uh, the infrastructure, what you mentioned, I think we need to be clear that uh, in order to be connected strategically, uh, we in Estonia are also going to, to replace uh, the railroad with, uh, with the European one. So I think that is also what, uh, what you need to do in order to really get rid of, uh, of a dependency, uh, dependency from, um, uh, from Russia. And of course, uh, for any businesses, I mean, FDI for us, foreign direct investment in Estonia, has been, I think, one of the key factors behind the success. We had uh, Nordic companies coming to Estonia, importing, or we imported, they exported the business culture. I think this is what uh, we are very happy to do also for Ukraine. So bring these values, these traditions, uh, the business culture, which is transparent. Uh, which attracts investment, and, and then I think, I mean, you are a country of 40 million people uh, with very good natural resources. You mentioned um, uh, we, we, are, we are collaborating with uh, Zetomer region, which is very rich of a forest, uh, so there is a shortage of timber in Estonia, which used to be imported from uh, Belarusia and, and Russia, so Ukraine is our friend, our good trading partner, so we can make a switch there, and this is just one example. I think there are plenty of them. Ukraine, for everybody in the audience, Estonia is a digital nation. Ukraine is really doing well. Uh, on the digital uh, uh, services, what the government is uh, providing, the, the, the D app, what you have, is actually more advanced than we have in Estonia. So there is plenty of uh, opportunities, what, uh, what this sort of also the digitalization of the world uh, will offer. And, and that's why for us, uh, I think like uh, Lisa mentioned, it's really a question about the values. I mean, th here you can't sit on a fence. You are either with the right side, uh, democracy and the future, or you are picking the wrong side. And that is a long-term legacy. Also, I think I very much agree with what Gennady said. Uh, investment in Ukraine is a long-term benefit. Once you build these business relations, you, you set it up, uh, I think there will be a major opportunity because Ukraine is going to be fast-growing, recovering country once you have won the war. And of course, the reconstruction needs to start already earlier. So we are, with all our energy, uh, financial means, and just a bit also into perspective, we have uh, given Ukraine aid, military and humanitarian, which is close to 1% of our GDP. Uh, we have received uh, more than 46,000 war refugees from Ukraine, which is 3.5% of our population. 
So we have been really welcoming uh, Ukrainians, and we are really uh, helping uh, helping you to uh, to get this fight to a successful uh, end. And then we all in a democratic world will have a safer place to live, have a brighter future. I hoped the war generation was a thing of uh, last century. Regrettably, it's not. So let's work together to uh, to rebuild Ukraine, to really stand by our words, help uh, where we can and we need, and most importantly, we all in the democratic world must stand united for the Ukraine. Slava Ukraini! Thank you very much, dear Andres, and I'm really, really uh, honored and happy to say that indeed Estonia and Latvia, by the way, uh, um, the two countries that committed the highest aid to Ukraine by the GDP share, um, and this is absolutely incredible, given the, the economic possibilities and the potential that um, the various European countries have. You guys are the leaders, and uh, you are the example for us. And if war has definitely shown who the enemy is, uh, another thing that the war has shown is definitely who the friends are. And this is as much important as, as that. And um, thank you very much for such an insightful intervention. I think that uh, what we learned uh, from you is how digitalization is indeed helping uh, a country to be resilient, to be flexible in terms of turmoil. And for us, I think it's a, a, lesson, a lesson that we have learned in a hard way, um, and we're still learning from it. Um, and the, another lesson is how um, the state um, reinvents its own role uh, during the crises. And uh, we have seen it all in, in the times of COVID. I think every country, more or less, uh, has realized that the state should rethink uh, itself and its role in, in intervening in the country's economy. But the war has provided uh, a new example of how active should be the state and how efficient uh, one should be. And um, with this in mind, I would like to address um, our Latvian colleague, Zeiga Lepnina. Did I say it correct? Yes. Yes, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I know that Ukrainian companies, they have strategic partners in Latvia. Uh, I'm talking about the DLRR, for instance, and uh, including the railway transportation and the repair uh, industry. And um, uh, they started experiencing financial difficulties at the start of the war uh, uh, in Ukraine. However, uh, given the strategic importance, uh, including for post-war reconstruction, of course, uh, our government made an exception for one of them. Uh, in the context of the debt, debt repayment. And um, how do you assess in the general possibility of the cooperation of the government with private companies, the support in terms of the shocks and crises, and uh, um, what kind of the cooperation future of Ukrainian and European countries do you see in the issue of post-war reconstruction in Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to... Uh, there is uh, organizers of forums that I think that's uh, really in very timely to talk on, on, on this uh, topic which uh, bothers everybody nowadays. And, and I think it's extremely important that we come together, we discuss, we look for solutions which are currently so important that how to restore uh, regional, uh, uh, global value chains, how to think what can be done in food and energy security and uh, of course foreign investments and I'm sure we will we will come out from uh, this crisis uh, Ukraine will all the support will win the war it's uh, important for to, uh, all European democracy to have uh, uh, soon uh, this uh, conflict stopped and uh, to start really massive reconstruction but yes like you said uh, even with the continuing uh, war there is continuing uh, support there is continuing as well investments but still of course it's extremely important uh, uh, to stop this uh, killing of innocent Ukrainian people and uh, uh, to start uh, the, uh, a real what can be done to help 
And uh, yes, uh, I would like to look at the perspective in short term. The short term perspective, we see that uh, all member states are supporting U European Union, member states supporting Ukraine, as well from European uh, funds. Uh, it's each month more than 5 billion euros is needed and uh, it's I think it should continue. It's important that we keep Ukrainian uh, government, Ukrainian people functioning because, of course, nowadays it's very limited uh, income from Ukrainian companies to government, uh, and uh, that should be continued. There is other issue, I think, which is extremely important. It is EU granted the uh, uh, most generous trade uh, regime for Ukraine, which was never been in European history, that free flows, no limits, uh, no even or the minimum requirements or very, very minimal technical requirements. And I think as well that should continue, but still we should look at the new perspectives, at new things, how we do things. Uh, on one hand, of course, Ukraine's uh, economic needs. Another hand, it is uh, all other European member states and their sensitivity to agriculture sector. But I think common projects are common uh, working together would be the, uh, a great solution. Like I said, yes, we are in Latvia supporting uh, very much Ukraine. Our official, let's say, government support is more than uh, uh, 220 million, but I don't, can't count how many private persons are supporting and uh, giving the support and for us as well it's close to 1% of GDP and uh, still we want to help and we will continue to help. And uh, second, I think it's extremely important that we work on supply chains, how we look for the new waves, uh, how Uh, priorities, I think, nowadays, and I very much appreciate this Turkish and uh, UN uh, involvement in this grain conflict, but still I think it should be done more that we find uh, the solution uh, on, uh, on uh, logistics. Um, and certainly working with international organizations, it's important to pressure uh, Russia uh, to stop this uh, inhuman uh, war and, of course, sanctions to uh, limit uh, Russia's income of war, uh, kind of possibilities of war. But on long term, on long term, certainly, like it was mentioned, Ukraine's candidacy status to Europe, Ukraine belongs to Europe, and we should do as fast as possible Ukraine's uh, integration to the European Union, uh, internal market, uh, to business environment. There is a lot of requirements, but I think we can do together. Even before war, we had a lot of projects together with our institutions. We as well did this Aki community chair. We did it fast, but Ukraine needs to do it three times at least faster than we did. And I think uh, it will be possible we have this experience, we have good contacts, and I am sure we will do. And, uh, and of course, uh, today's theme, and which is not topic number one, is reconstruction, reconstruction, reconstruction of Ukraine, help to Ukraine, investments in Ukraine. And now, now that our companies are already having uh, contacts and projects and planning to, to do it, and uh, I think it should be continued and um, all the best, and I really encourage everybody to do it uh, as uh, fast as possible that we all together help and work together. Thank you. Thank you very much. I um, totally agree, but I would like to uh, draw your attention on the um, uh, aspect that rebuilding Ukraine um, is much more than a, a thing of a solidarity in terms of principles and shared values. What I'm trying to, to say is that um, we want your skin in the game uh, in Ukraine as much as for us foreign capital and foreign direct investments would mean our personal security. Um, I think that if that would have happened throughout the last uh, decade, the situation even in Crimea would be dramatically different. 
for, that, for this reason, we are trying to advocate something that we uh, joke uh, about and we call the, the, the Strasbourg plan or the Brussels plan because of the um, European institutions or the Council of Europe in Strasbourg and Turkey is a member of the Council of Europe as much as Azerbaijan is in other countries. The idea is not to merely have a Marshall plan when you ask the countries to put the money on the table and uh, then trust in, in the reconstruction. Uh, and the happy future uh, of the Ukrainian nation. Now, uh, the idea is to provide each and every government uh, who is supporting Ukraine an opportunity to clearly specify what kind of industry it is interested in. I think this is a very pragmatic and a very um, efficient approach that one should take. I think that um, it has a lot of potential we have been talking to different um, members of the Council of Europe, um, say the, the Dutch, for example, they're very interested in water management, the Germans in natural gas, uh, the, the Czech in metallurgy, uh, and so on and so forth. And I think there is nothing wrong uh, in having this very frank conversation with one with, with another and to discuss what kind of industries and sectors can be interesting to specific governments and their specific investors. Because then, if you take Turkey, for instance, uh, if you decide to take a specific sector and to become an anchor or a strategic investor in that kind of sector, then your government is able to develop some kind of the support program, the cheap loans or government security, and so on and so forth, to support your national investors that will be willing to enter the Ukrainian market. And it will be easier for everyone because you will have this kind of argument of what our country is doing in, in, in a state that is uh, at war. It's earning money there, earning money for your taxpayers as well, but also helping us to increase our resilience. Because for us, the, the argument is absolutely obvious and it's very logical. The best security guarantee Ukraine can have, and this is my personal opinion, is the presence of the foreign capital in its strategic sectors. This is the best security guarantee we can have. For you, as I mentioned before, this is an opportunity to enter new spheres, new sectors, new industries, and to start from scratch, and that means to become an anchor, a strategic investor for uh, a time being. Um, in terms of uh, what my um, uh, colleague Zaiga mentioned, uh, that we need to grow three times faster. <laughs> I think uh, it's, um, it, it can be mathematically confirmed. Um, because if you take a very simple calculation, say your economy is worth $100 and it falls by 50% and it starts to be $50. So if you grow it back by 50%, your economy will be worth only $75. So this is simple math. And it means and it shows us that we need to grow at least twice faster than we have been falling. And uh, with the total assessment of the damages exceeding one billion uh, of dollars. Beg your pardon? Hundreds, no, uh, trillion, I meant trillion, sorry, trillion, one trillion of dollars. There is no way we can do it ourselves. And that is why we deadly, literally, need uh, our partners uh, to, to enter the Ukrainian markets, but we want you to enter it as partners. Not just, we don't want it to be, uh, you know, um, uh, we want it to be a joint venture. Uh, we want it, we want it, we don't want to be a nation of beggars. We want to be a nation of partners and we are ready to um, have a very pragmatic discussion on how to reconstruct Ukraine and, and, and how to save everyone's skins in the game uh, in, in doing so. Um, we have heard from all the three of you um, various aspects of the impact that the war is having on the world economy. And um, one might say that this is uh, a, sure, um, a sure symbol of the crisis of uh, globalization. And uh, if you take the last conference in Davos, uh, this was precisely the main topic. Is globalization dead? Do we need to get to regionalization? 
to save our countries from these dependencies, from these hostile dependencies, um, and uh, to try to rethink our cooperation. I would be really interested in your thoughts, uh, ladies and gentlemen, what do you think? Do, do we need a smarter form of cooperation? Do we need to rethink globalization in a smarter form? Or do we need a greater isolation uh, and uh, self-reliance of the economies? Um, if I could ask you to pick this question one by one, I would really appreciate it. Yeah, that's a big one. Uh, so I think what we need first is to get back to a rules-based world trade and order, because that has been really broken uh, with a war in, uh, uh, in, in Ukraine. So is uh, globalization dead? Uh, I don't think so, but it certainly is in reverse. Uh, because if you look back, uh, I mean, many countries benefited from uh, exporting or uh, carrying their production uh, to Asia and to, to other countries, which then uh, again uh, did uh, get into reverse very quickly with COVID and now with, with the war. So I think it's inevitable that there is some degree uh, and actually significant degree of nearshoring or bringing business back to, uh, to manageable proximity. Uh, and this is where I think uh, also Ukraine, but many other European countries uh, but I would say also Turkey would, uh, would benefit because also for Turkey, uh, European Union is, is, is the largest uh, trading partner. So uh, I think we have always gained uh, with more trade between the nations. So this is where we need to get back. But before we get back, I think we, we, we need to, to make also sure that the rules, uh, rules are followed. So, um, uh, and... Uh, for Estonia and also for Ukraine and I think for all European countries uh, there is clearly a need for more investment in, uh, in innovation, in technology uh, and this is what is happening uh, and again I think Ukraine is well positioned to, uh, to offer some say critical uh, raw materials, uh, a good uh, 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 edu educated people. So I think uh, there is a lot what we can do closer together. And then I hope we can again say that the globalization is moving to a right direction with a higher speed. When it happens, honest answer, I don't know. But uh, we should really make, make it work because we, we, we gained a lot also for, uh, I think, uh, reducing the poverty globally. I mean, these things, I mean, trade has always helped always. So the more we can trade, the better place the world will be. So let's work on, uh, on making this to, to happen. Thank you very much. Uh, Gennady, do you think that this war of, uh, in, in Ukraine has shown uh, an opportunity that trade should be increased and this can be uh, an instrument to, to reach more, a more peaceful and re resilient uh, community in the world? Or is something like strategic autonomy is, is the, the way that we should follow? No, it's, uh, uh, it's very uh, easy and very difficult to answer to, uh, this question because from one side point of view, the, uh, uh, we, have, we, have feeling, we are feeling something. Uh, we are feeling what something happened. Happened what they, uh, when I see, the, not about the war, I sp speak about the change in the world, the global world, and how everything will be. It's nobody uh, can to predict. There are a lot of forecasts, etc. From my point of view, uh, we, uh, think, uh, we are living in the situation when the technology and, uh, uh, and the attitude to the uh, savings of the world will be a more important role. We do you see, if, for example, come back to the Ukraine and uh, uh, what, what is the war? If I'm not a big, of course, it's a big specialist in the military operation, but a lot of people see what the war became, uh, it's a little bit different. It's not when we uh, uh, war when we um, one thousand soldiers to one to one thousand soldiers in one field stay and doing something. This is uh, we now are feeling what the country who has a more uh, uh, 
adaptive uh, military uh, weapons it's uh, to the new situation uh, it's working it will be the one of the main main trained uh, second one it's who controls the uh, uh, food it also will be the uh, more uh, successful my position I, I very often share with uh, with European European city, with European countries uh, maybe it's a little bit naive, but uh, I would like to share that situation when the Ukraine and the European Union unite, and this is, it will be win-win. Why? Because uh, if you see the last um, 10, 20 years, the, uh, some books, some uh, good monographies, uh, a lot of authors said what uh, uh, the epoch of Europe go, far, uh, go in the past. The new uh, countries, like uh, the new continent, like Asia, will be from, uh, for it will be the new focus of the on these countries. I'm not sure. Uh, honestly speaking, I'm not sure, because if we join, uh, if, for example, if we uh, unite uh, if, uh, possibilities of Ukraine and Europe, and uh, it will be in only in the uh, agriculture sector. You, uh, Europe has everything in the agriculture sector. We add a lot of, and we can control opinion. Sorry, of course it's like this. Opinion of many countries in the world because we see what it is. You, Europe became one of the most important players, not only the production of agriculture products, but also most important food processing. And for us, Ukraine uh, and Europe uh, needed, uh, we would like to cooperate, not on the, to continue this story, what I said before, about bread basket of Europe. Our idea is an absolutely different one. We would like to be the big supermarket of the world. This is more interesting, and where we can to produce. And uh, do you understand, the world, uh, if the, all the world like products from the Europe, good quality, etc., it's very big influence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's my my opinion. The global trade, the role uh, of the Europe, together with new possibilities, it will be absolutely new, and we need to to take in uh, account this. This from my uh, this is my uh, uh, opinion. And one more uh, new technology became very important, and continents and uh, countries who control this. Uh, no, so control it a little bit. Who produced more and more will be the uh, will be the winner in in uh, in this ga uh, sorry, game, and uh, we see how Europe uh, go f forward in this direction. They, uh, uh, for example, I contacted with my colleagues from today from Bulgaria, from Slovakia, from France, etc. Everybody, every in all these countries, open new centers of new technologies. And what else? In Europe, 95% or maybe more, I don't know the statistic, people are very good educated and uh, has a huge potential in entrepreneurship. That's why I'm a little go, uh, when you ask asking about the globalization, I go, uh, I like Europe. That's why, I'm sorry, it's, uh, I like Asia and uh, everything. But I'm, for me, it's always interesting to have a very interesting challenge. The, for Europe, everything is closed, or it's a new one, and will, it will be very big challenge for all uh, for Europe. We will find our place, or I don't like to see, say this was loser. No, we never will be the loser. Thank you. Thank you, Gennady. Um, now, Zaga, what do you think? Do do countries like Turkey or countries like Latvia should cultivate regional ties and regional uh, kind of alliances, and to rely more on their direct neighbors? Or should they invest in differentiating the supply chains and uh, to to you know to uh, reinvigorate the international trade in a way? Thank you. Uh, thank you. I think regionally we are already linked because we are European Union, customs union with Turkey, and uh, certainly mentally we are as well having the same values, sharing them and working together. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, I think it's extremely important to keep the global. Uh, values uh, to keep the global value chains open. Uh, yeah, we certainly have now different trade. We will value the trade not only from the trade openness, but as well from common values like mindness with us. I think that will be the uh, coming out of this crisis. That it is important that you 
have the strategic partnerships, we in Europe call it an open strategic partnerships because, of course, it is that uh, one country has one raw material, another, another, and there should be uh, cooperation and uh, thinking together to do certainly technological development will uh, bring us to the new era. Yeah, we have now in Europe this twin uh, transition, digitalization, and uh, how to reduce uh, dependence on gas and how to get uh, greener. Uh, we will certainly as well manage that uh, challenge for us and uh, come out of this uh, not so easy situation currently with a much stronger setting what standards and cooperating. And I think it's trade certainly help to everybody to be open and, uh, and, and uh, to have common interests uh, worldwide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that a very important point has been made uh, regarding the new technologies. Uh, I think that this floor has also shown how much new technologies um, are improving and are making you um, compatible um, in, in a way um, that you can face the new challenges. It, it, you might well know that a lot of Ukrainians, literally who are not serving in any army, but just random citizens and people, have been photographing uh, military trade convoys of Russia, sending the coordinates to the special security service. And this is all has been done through Telegram bots, DIA uh, application, and so on and so forth. And this is something that the world has never seen before. And this influx of the new technology in, into, into the war uh, gives us an outlook of how it is important in, in our regular life. And even take Turkey, the Bayraktar, I mean, this is the new technology that has, has dramatically changed the course of two wars already. And it has changed the course in the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And now it's also changing the course of war in, uh, in, in Ukraine. This is, this is also very true. And uh, um, Andres was very right on t t talking about this, um, uh, the, um, the digitalization as well. And I think that the more a country transfers everything online to the digital, the more resilient it becomes. Um, but there is also one characteristic I would like to think uh, about, and this war has also proven that it's cru cru crucially important, this is speed. The fastest you are in this world, the fastest you can take decisions, the fastest you can react, the more advantage you have. And um, I would say that this is something that Ukraine will be bidding on um, in, the, in the closest future, to become one of the fastest economies in the, in the continent, at least. And for that, you need to be digitalized. You need to transfer everything to, to, to digital as much as possible. You need to be also predictable. And predictability is a predictable tax system. Uh, it's a predictable migration system. It's a predictable custom system. Um, and this kind of speed, it also increases um, the, the intensities of transactions. So it makes your money more efficient in the economy. And the more efficient are the money in the economy, the less amount of money in the economy you need. And that is pure economic theory. So in a way, by increasing the speed of the economy and increasing the, the intensity of transactions, you are taking away the burden of the inflation in a way, and you're taking away the burden of the money mass that you have in your own economy. But you cannot increase the speed and the intensity of the transactions in, in economies and in states that are um, still operating uh, in the 20th uh, century's way, in an old-fashioned way. And that is when you need new technologies again. And I think that Ukraine has also a lot to, to present in terms of the technology, in terms of the digital. Um, starting with uh, DIA, as we have mentioned, and ending with um, uh, with other uh, in, in, in innovative ideas. But I think that that is definitely one of, of the things that we will be beating is on the fast state and the fast economy. And this war has proven that this is uh, an efficient tactic. Uh, is there is something else uh, we would like to discuss? Because we don't have one more speaker and we um, we 
we are ready to finish a bit earlier or is anybody be up for a lunch break earlier and uh, everybody might be hungry and we will let you go and have your meal, ladies and gentlemen? I think we can do it, right? Oh, we have a question. Yeah, please, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, hello everyone. My name is Seda Hewitt, and I'm here to represent Hungarian Export Promotion Agency. Well, I'm here to represent myself, <laughs> that, that I can say. First of all, I would like to really thank you all, uh, the TGEIF uh, organization, especially the Tristan Evans to invite me to that uh, organization. I'm really happy to be here. I don't want to continue the same things, but I'm really here personally because I would like to be here in person. I'm not uh, here because uh, my uh, institution want me to come over here. I want to come here as SEDA because uh, I'm really sorry about the uh, hardship that Ukrainians are really experiencing even the exact same moment. And I would like to come over here just to say, I'm here not only representing a government uh, institution, I'm here to represent Hungarian companies who actually would like to help Ukraine to rebuild again. I'm here to represent my friends, my Turkish friends, my Hungarian friends, my friends all over the world, so I can spread the world that what we can need, what we can do all together. So, I'm a very interactive person. I'm, I'm sorry for you know, standing up again. Because at first, I would like to observe what people are talking. I would like to hear from you what you need, what we can do for you, and what you can do for us. And after that, I would like to just stand up and uh, just tell what I think. I just would like to say I'm here, whatever I can do as a person, as Seda, I'm here, and I will really would like to speak to you, all of you, for the two days when you have time. Please reach over. If you just see me, just tap on the shoulder, say hi. I'm sure we will find a common point to interact, to be friends, or communicate again in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sita. Uh, yeah. We're here for you as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And one more thing, uh, I will uh, write a report about what we talk, what we all talk about, what we need about Ukraine. I don't care if they fire me, probably they can fire me. That's also a possibility. Because when you think about the, the situation of Hungary right now, but I will take the risk because, as you said before, nicely put, brave will favor the uh, future, will favor the brave. So I just would like to stand up and be brave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Anton Kononov. Uh, I came from Poland, but I'm Ukrainian. Uh, I have a question. Do we have some plans regarding decarbonization of our economy? Uh, the question is, um, why, why I'm asking about it? Because if we would like to become uh, a member of the European Union, uh, we need to uh, harmonize uh, our uh, our law and uh, also in uh, energy sector so uh, as you may be know uh, in europe we have uh, uh, we have a um, co2 taxonomy so uh, so we are talking about co2 footprint and uh, all of business uh, all of companies, industry, and so on, and so on, and uh, heating and energy sector must to reduce CO2 emission, and they pay for that emission um, more. Moreover, uh, from uh, 2025, each product will be have their green certificate. So. Um, how much CO2 footprint has each each product? Uh, also, also we need to uh, become uh, independent 
from uh, Russian uh, natural gas and so on and so on. So my question is, do we have some plan how we can not only rebuild Ukraine and uh, its energy and uh, industry sector, but also decarbonize it and build independent industry and energy sector? Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I think that this is a very timely question. Uh, because the baddest pollutant there is, is war. And this is as simple as that. Uh, to be frank, and I'm sure, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry if I might sound harsh right now, but it makes no sense talking about the green future when there is war in the middle of Europe that is literally polluting with every missile that is being produced or is hitting a field or a building that it gets on fire then and it emits the CO2 and all the other uh, nasty stuff that uh, you mentioned. Um, this kind of pollution keeps on going and going and going and there is no way you can stop it. It, it only deteriorates, it gets even worse uh, because the production of the military equipment uh, is very pollutant. It's in fact one of the biggest pollutant in, in, in industry. And the war itself creates a lot of pollution. Now, um, another aspect of that is that uh, the war uh, that Russia has unleashed in Ukraine has changed the budgeting of all of the major European and Asian and other countries. And uh, with changing of those budgets in adding more money to the arms race to produce to the production of the security uh, and defensive weapons, it means that less money and less budget will be transferred in, in other programs, development programs like the uh, CO2 or Green Deal. And this is another critical aspect we have to understand that as long as there is war in Ukraine or anywhere else in the war, uh, in, in the world, um, you will see less money in education, in uh, environment, in medicine, in any other programs that are designed to make a person's life longer and more peaceful. Because war makes a person's life shorter and more... Uh, um, more... Uh, hard. Sorry. So, if you might, if you might heard uh, regarding the UK, for instance, and this is just a quick example to give you, um, the gas crisis in the EU, because of the Russian gas blackmail, uh, has forced the UK to unseal the coal mines for the time being, to supply the power uh, that they lack in order to. Um, to, to provide heat to the population. So, and that is a simple example of what is the, the aftermath of this war and what are the, um, the, the consequences of it. So, um, it is a very important topic you're raising, absolutely important. And I think in reconstructing the country, once the war is over, we will have to make sure that this reconstruction is done in, in the green terms, right? But uh, before that, we need to make sure the war is over because we need to end the biggest pollution there is uh, as there is uh, out there now, and this is a war and the um, defense and the um, uh, defense industry and the defense product production sector. So that would be my short answer. Yes, please. Uh, I am Shev Kjelgen, and it's a question and a suggestion. The two uh, biggest challenges in con reconstruction is resources and implementation. And I wanted you to tell the rest of the world how you are planning the implementation, including the governance of the implementation, because monies will be found, but the implementation will have to be taken charge by the Ukrainian people, Ukrainian politicians. And uh, so that is my question to you to communicate to us how you're preparing for that, because we have to start it. Even though we're in the middle of the war, which we have to win, 
other work also has to go in parallel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dushaki. Um So we had a conference in Lugano uh, a month ago, maybe less, less, where hundreds of Ukrainian officials didn't manage to answer your question. <laughs> now you want me to try to do it. Beg your pardon? Just a second, yeah, but uh, the truth is, jokes apart, the truth is that I think that nobody has this answer. Because even in Lugano, what we have heard is that the EBRD has its own view. The World Bank has their own view. The IFC <laughs> has their own view. And the Ukrainian government has its own view. Oh. Now, what I would advocate for, and this is what I'm doing in my country, is to have this kind of you have heard about the Rammstein, right? Uh, the, the military Rammstein, the, the meetings where um, a number of ministers of defense have gathered and developed a, a, a single policy on the military assistance. We need an economic Rammstein. We need the same. But we need it to last for as long as it is required for all the decision make makers and stakeholders to sit in one place for one day, two days, three days, four days, and go out with a clear policy of how this will be proceeded. I uh, briefly touched upon uh, your question in talking about this Brussels or Strasbourg plan, in talking to each and every government regarding specific spheres that industries that they might be interested in, and then drafting it in one single document or a roadmap. I think that would be a much more pragmatic approach, an approach that will be much more better understood by the governments. But um, still, there are deba debates on that. And um, unfortunately, there is no single answer or an easy answer to your question. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah, and again, I First of all, uh, no, no, no. Second, I would like to add what Mr. Shevkin said, a very very important questions. Uh, we uh, tried to answer this question the last minimum 30 years. But uh, from my point of view, no any answer if the, our society will join, uh, uh, how to say, efforts. And for me, it's like a president of Chamber of Commerce. It's very interesting, very important. What uh, I never saw like it was before, the business started uh, last four, six months, joined. We would like to, to, to be the real player and in the ma making the decision in the post-war uh, period as well. This is concerning also the civil society. No another way. If the civil society business uh, can't arise their voice, no choice. That's why my answer, we needed to support our government, we need to support our country, but uh, our voice should be uh, listened by them. Thank you. Thank you. Our dear friend from Turkey, please. Yes. Uh, we are from Georgia. Uh, from Georgia, all, beg your pardon. Uh, I want to uh, say that it's an honor to be here. Uh, we are supporting Ukraine. Uh, and uh, I have questions and also we have some kind of uh, suggestions. Of course, we will discuss it with your colleagues uh, later also. But uh, uh, what is the main idea? Uh, we are uh, supporting Ukraine and we like initiate uh, uh, act of support to Ukraine and all Georgian construction and developer sector are ready to be involved. For this, uh, Ukrainian embassy in Georgia is working very hardly, and uh, very soon, uh, also it will be, it will be like officially announced. Uh, also, we represent our, uh, we work very closely with ASEAN Gulf countries with investors, and we uh, represent uh, Georgia in wet countries, and we already uh, discussed with them, and uh, where is the high readiness to be also involved in this process uh, to invest with projects in Ukraine. But uh, as you know, uh, and we hope very soon it will be possible and will be peace uh, that Ukraine. But uh, as you know, it's very uh, important to uh, like to do business simply. Uh, are you going to simplify some kind of some regulations in Ukraine in these directions? Uh, because it will be very important for that moment. Thank you and success. Thank you very much. Just a quick answer to that and I will give you the floor, okay? Uh, uh, yes, deregulation is an, a critical aspect of uh, the concept that I mentioned regarding the fast state and the fast economy. 
you simply cannot have any economies that might be called fast if the processes are taking you so long, as long as months, is, right? And even years sometimes. So without deregulating, without doing that regulation guillotine, any economy cannot call itself fast. And if you're not uh, a fast economy in this fastly changing world, then you die. So that's, that is a question to your answer, uh, an answer to your question, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, definitely we're, we're going to deregulate the, the business processes and uh, um, to, to make them as predictable and as simple as possible. Thank you. Yep, the gentleman over there, please. We're not going to eat earlier today, I'm sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Karungu Peter from Johannesburg. I won't have missed this for any reason. It's an expression of solidarity among mankind. What we watch in Ukraine is painful, and I must say, it's unbearable. So I'm here to demonstrate solidarity among humanity. Second, there is an MP who spoke, Lisa, she was seated there. She has become one of the most women anchor we have ever seen on TV. She has motivated a lot of women, young, worldwide. Thank you to you, we can never, ever forget you. I'm a businessman, I'm a professor, I teach economics. She articulated something I will never forget. I teach it. Any business without a purpose and sustainability for the future of our children is doomed to fail. It's a question of how long it will take, I'm not sure. What do I do? I took a commitment to create women jobs worldwide. I didn't have money. I knew nothing. But I knew Johnson & Johnson, American company, sells a product an average 50 times what cost. I researched, I found it. I said, but we can do it. Today, I supply globally. I manufacture human spare parts, that's what I do. I manufacture sutures, wires, bridges, and now I'm designing human heart valve. It's selling worldwide. And the reason I'm saying this is because I would want to see how I can help Ukraine. I'm not a politician, I'm a businessman, highly emotional when I see pain, particularly impacted on women. It's too painful to bear. Uh, to Lisa, we will be with you as long as you will win. That, I don't know whether that's her name, but I thought she's Lisa. She's somewhere seated somewhere in front. She already left. So tell her, we love her, we adore her, we will work hard until the end. We will win. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Just, uh, my name is Thorsten Bolt. I'm working for the European Commission in Ukraine normally, now because of the war that's a bit uh, difficult. I'm working on energy sessions, so some of the questions that were raised we will definitely discuss in the energy session. But just one remark, what is also important for the recovery and the industrial success is networking. It's, of course, also deregulation, rule of law, but it's also networking. And the EU is promoting, supporting industrial partnerships, which are networks uh, of partners where Ukraine can participate, lots of other partners. Uh, not, it's not only EU. It's centered EU, but not only EU. And I would like to encourage also when we do networking here to think about this, how we can use these uh, platforms. Uh, for instance, we have discussed uh, uh, renewable gases cooperation, biomethane, green hydrogen, etc., as one of the axes of development for Ukraine, because Ukraine is a fossil fuel importer, but it can, can become easily a green energy exporter. Yeah, so it's a it's changing a weakness to a strength. And I think this should be our perspective here also. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I, I agree with both of the speakers, and in terms of the networking, uh, I, would, uh, I would like to make a very important statement here. What, uh, we have been working lately uh, with some colleagues from the UK Parliament is, for example, an introduction of the uh, humanitarian safe harbor status over the port of Odessa. Uh, in order to um, try to unlock it and to secure the export of the grain from that port, because if, uh, as you might know, it exports more than 50% of uh, the Ukrainian export. Uh, now, in order to do that, we would need a vote in a general assembly of the United Nations. That is the only way to do it. And uh, I will... I would like to ask everyone representing your own nation to give it a thought on whether your country might support such a decision in the United Nations General Assembly. And that is an aspect of the networking, as uh, you mentioned, and this is the networking, the networking I'm doing right now, trying to address you to take it to your governments, to your countries, to support this decision, because I think this will ease the pain from the food security uh, crisis that is there uh, for everyone. Um, there was one last question we can take from a lady. I don't see her. Maybe she's... Yes. I'm here. Hi. Sorry. So I'm Hilal Sarı from Dunya Daily Economics, the one and only eco daily economics of Turkey, actually. So my question will be regarding the possible post-war uh, economic uh, partnership between our countries. Uh, my question will be, which sectors are in focus? I see one of our huge construction companies, so I take it as one of the obvious sectors, but what are the focus sectors for bilateral uh, partnership? And my second question is about the food crisis and the controversial claims about the uh, stolen grain uh, and the current ongoing negotiations about the Grain corridor in Black Sea. Uh, so yeah, that's all. My questions are for the board. Thank you. Um, I'll start from the from the end. So yesterday, my colleague, deputy and MP also, and the negotiator uh, Rustem Umerov, who might be well known uh, here in Turkey, uh, he reported that there is an argument to um, blockade three Ukrainian por ports uh, in the Black Sea to deblockade them. Um, the port of Odessa, which actually provided about 50% of Ukrainian export, is also on the list. Uh, it hasn't been finalized yet, but th there seems to be some progress there, hopefully. I don't see any con anything controversial regarding the statements of the stolen grain, because uh, this is a fact that has been confirmed by a number of different institutions. Unfortunately, Russia does that. Uh, Regarding the, the opportunities uh, of cooperation, um, so I would, I would divide um, everything in, two, in three big chunks. Chunk number one is something we need right here, right now, to stop this war as fast as possible. And that means that the first chunk of investments that we badly need today is something to produce uh, defense or offense equipment. Um, I'm talking about and a plant that, produ that is producing bullets, uh, a plant that is producing um, drones, uh, and so on and so forth. So that is top priority right now. If we can do that, uh, that is the something that will literally save lives and make this war shorter. The second big chunk of investments we need right now is to ease the suffering of random people. And that means basic infrastructure. That means housing, that means uh, water supply, that means uh, energy supply, roads, um, and so on and so forth. So everything that will um, provide the opportunity for Ukrainians whose houses have been destroyed, whose cities have been destroyed, to start a decent life somewhere else, uh, in a small apartment, in a small private house. Um, and for that, we need materials, we need construction uh, companies, and. Uh, uh, we need some 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 basic uh, infrastructure. That is chunk number two, and chunk number three is basically reinvigorating uh, the sectors and uh, stimulating export. And uh, for that reason, um, where those um, investments uh, might go are, of course, metallurgy, uh, grain, uh, agriculture sector, 
um, and all other sectors that have been generating export uh, value um, in the last couple of uh, decades in Ukraine. So those three big chunks um, are a very general overview of uh, where the money, I think, might go to. If you want to take any chunk precisely, specifically, then you can go in, in, into details and uh, easily uh, find a, a small project uh, with which you can start um, attracting investors uh, to, to this specific project. Thank you. Objection, yeah, of course. Uh, let's go for the objections. Yeah. Regarding, uh, regarding my question, my objection is, uh, you said that it's not time to think about ecology. Okay, maybe you're right, the war is for sure a more, more important thing, but I mean uh, something, another thing that, uh, for example, nowadays the natural gas is so expensive that it is cheaper to produce green hydrogen to, um, for example, uh, for example, not only for make electricity like energy storage, but for example, in, uh, in industry, uh, industrial process, uh, in um, in metallurgical uh, steel plants, in uh, agriculture sector, and uh, now we we uh, can produce green ammonia from the green hydrogen. It is will it will be cheaper than grey ammonia, they uh, that produced from um, natural gas. So I mean that it is it is um, good for our economic. Uh, the first one, the second one, we will be independent from the uh, natural gas from Russia, and the third one, we will be green. Yes. So uh, I I mean that it is economical. It have, uh, has economical efficiency, yes. Not only uh, ecology, yes, but uh, but it's, it will be cheaper. And uh, if someone uh, wants to reduce their costs by natural gas and their production facility, you are welcome. Uh, in in Europe, it is um, rather uh, rather well known things. Not not so on, but. But uh, but our company helps helps industry and uh, central heating and uh, fertilizers production facilities with green ammonia, for example, to to increase the cost to become green and to become independent. That's what I mean. That was my objection. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think there is something to object for, object for because, uh, of course, it's always time to talk about uh, um, ecology. For instance, we were very much uh, worried uh, regarding the Russians occupying Chernobyl or Zaporizhia nuclear plant, uh, which might have become a new tragedy and a catastrophe for the whole world again in case a missile would hit uh, one of those objects so uh, ecology is always important nevertheless uh, if you're taking ammonia as an example then uh, i'll tell you this the capacity to produce enough green ammonia um, through a process that is called electrolysis isn't that right that produces hydrogen uh, i'm afraid it's present only on the odessa plant uh, Opaza, the, uh, the Odessa port plant. Now, do you reckon how much money would you need to refurbish the Opaza in order to produce, start producing hydrogen enough to feed all the Ukrainian capability? I would think that there are like tens of millions, maybe billions, probably, and then to improve the, the infrastructure that is carrying that uh, hydrogen throughout the country and maybe even to Europe. So while that is a very good idea and a brilliant example of where money might be invested into, I think that um, as of today, we will be finding ourselves in a very difficult position to replace uh, Ukrainian natural gas towards hydrogen or green ammonia in times of war. This is my opinion. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are now at 12.47. Uh, I would like to thank the brilliant uh, members of the panel. Thank you very much. Let's give, let's give them an applause. And thank you very much, everybody, for this insightful discussion. See you at the lunch. Thank you.
before you leave, I just wanted to remind that for the lunch, uh, it's going to be until 2 p.m. And one more reminder, please, for our dear speakers and sponsors and platinum uh, guests. There will be a boat at uh, 7.30 p.m. from Demter of Razia Sabatash Port. Uh, and Aydin Sadat will be the name of the boat. And we are waiting for you also there. Just quickly reminding that. And bon appétit for everyone. Afiat Olsun. And hope to see you at 2 p.m.